Welcome back to Historical Context. Today we continue our colonization of New England unit and we are going to talk about the early days of the Plymouth Colony today. Where we left off last week, it was Christmas of 1620 and the Pilgrims were erecting the first structure of the new colony. On December 28th, they took a census for the number of families to determine how many houses needed to be built. They counted a total of 19 families. Edward Winslow, writing Mort's Relation, discussed how the plots were laid out. Let's have a look. To greater families we allotted larger plots. To every person half a pole in breadth and three in length. And so lots were cast where every man should lie, which was done and staked out. So we could see some planning going on there in terms of constructing the colony and how they want to do that. Uh, really don't recall anything like that from our Jamestown unit or any information like that. I think it was more or less every man for himself in Jamestown and that kind of led to how they got spread out. But in Plymouth it looks like they're plotting things out accordingly. The colony was seeing that cold weather was impacting their health and considered the weakness of certain individuals as they were working on how to build this colony. As work began, Winslow noted on several occasions, great fires could be seen at a distance of six or seven miles away, presumably by natives. On January 4, 1621, Miles Standish led a small expedition inland to try and make contact with the natives. They did not find any inhabited locations, but did shoot and kill an eagle for food, stating that it was, quote, excellent meat, hardly discerned from mutton. On January 9th, they began building the houses, agreeing to do it in two rows for the best defense. It was agreed that each man would build their own house. A common house was constructed for gatherings and by January 9th it was nearly finished. On January 11th, William Bradford becomes extremely ill and as a result in his book of Plymouth Plantation, the winter of 1620-21 is scarcely mentioned. So we have to rely on Edward Winslow of Mort's relation to cover those gaps. On January 14th, those still on the ship, so there were people living on the ship while they were building the colony, noticed that the brand new common house was on fire. Both Bradford and Carver were bedridden in the house at the time of the fire, but managed to escape before the fire destroyed the building. At this point, Winslow's writing becomes scarce, likely due to the fact that many were becoming sick at Plymouth. On January 30th and 31st, Winslow notes that two natives were seen at a distance, but too far away to signal down. On February 9th, a dead deer was found that had its antlers cut off by the natives, and wolves were seen eating it. That makes you wonder about the scarcity of the food at the time. On February 16th, a colonist was a mile and a half from the colony when he saw 12 natives and claimed to have heard many more heading towards the colony. He hurried back ahead of them, but nothing came of the threat. Because of this scare, the colonists decided to formally create an army and named Miles Standish as the captain. Later, on February 17th, the colonists encountered two natives, but as they approached, they heard more natives behind them and decided not to proceed. Bradford, while brief in his writing, did summarize the winter of 1620-21. Let's have a look. In two or three months' time, nearly half of their company had died, partly owing to the severity of the winter, 
especially during January and February, and the want of houses and other comforts, partly to scurvy and other diseases which their long voyage and their incommodious quarters had brought upon them. He continues, Of all the hundred odd persons, scarcely fifty remained. In the worst times of distress there were but six or seven sound persons, who spared no pains night or day, fetched wood, made fires, prepared food for the sick, made their beds, washed their infected clothes, dressed and undressed them. Miles Standish and Elder William Brewster were named by Bradford as two of the seven individuals who remained healthy. So it required heroic work from just a few individuals to care for those remaining in the colony as it was a tough winter. And again, uh, likely just the toughest time to show up and settle a colony in December nonetheless. So that was certainly difficult on the Plymouth Pilgrims. As winter drew to an end, March 16th brought one of the more memorable days in American history. Let's have a look. A certain Indian came boldly among them and spoke to them in broken English, which they could well understand, but were astonished at it. He was not of these parts, but belonged to the eastern country, where some English came to fish. With some of these he was acquainted and could name several of them. So a native came and spoke broken English to the Plymouth Pilgrims. I'm sure they were rather astonished by that. The native man's name was Samoset, and in Winslow's writings, it was indicated that his home was a five days walk away. Samoset informed them that the Patuxet had lived where they were currently at and a plague had wiped them out four years prior. So had a plague not occurred there, the pilgrims would have landed right where the Patuxet tribe was living. According to Bradford, a peace was negotiated with Samoset that included Samoset's tribe notifying other Confederate tribes of this peace. The terms read similar to a military alliance. Samoset warned them that the Nossets were opposed to the English thanks to a slave trader named Hunt. So now this is where we have to kind of orient ourselves with the history of this area. There were Englishmen coming into native villages and taking natives and selling them for slaves in Europe and more specifically in Spain. And that was discussed somewhat a couple of weeks ago in our Precursor to Plymouth episode. And so for more information there, I'd suggest going back a couple of weeks and viewing that episode. A few days later, Samoset returned with five other natives. One of the items they brought was powdered corn that they mixed with water and ate. They also had a little tobacco. The natives left, but Samoset stayed with the pilgrims for another two days. The pilgrims planted their garden seeds on March 19th and March 20th. On March 21st, the pilgrims met amongst each other to finalize their laws and ordinances but were, for the third time, as Winslow reports, interrupted by the sighting of natives. These were spotted at a distance and seemed menacing, but ran away as the pilgrims approached them. On March 22nd, Samoset returned and brought a native named Squanto with him. Squanto was discussed two weeks ago. Along with the king of the Massasoit, after some back and forth as to who to send amongst the Pilgrim delegation, Edward Winslow went to represent them. In the meeting, the Massasoit King wanted to purchase armor and a sword from one of the Pilgrims. 
but the pilgrims were unwilling to sell it. After some jostling back and forth, the king agreed to meet with Governor Carver, and a peace treaty was made, similar to the one negotiated with Samoset. Both native tribes that had alliances with the pilgrims were adversaries of the Narragansett tribe, creating a potential problem for the pilgrims down the line. It's important to note that it took four months for the pilgrims to make contact with the natives after arriving at Plymouth. With alliances in place, what will happen to the pilgrims next? Will they be drawn into conflict? And what happens when a major death rocks the colony? We'll talk about that next time on Historical Context. <laughs>